Hello everyone, welcome to May. We have a new month of topics. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by seasoned trainers, Chad and Nick, and I'm especially delighted to welcome John Lepore of Perception to join us on this session. Hi everyone. Hey, thanks for having me, Simon. Oh, it's, it's our privilege and pleasure. Thank you for joining us. And the, just to let you all know, the you've probably seen this, the reason why you're here is that you looked at the description and then you clicked on the registration button. But what we're gonna do is something slightly different for this month. We've, we've got a range of FUI graphics or futuristic user interface graphics to show you over the forthcoming weeks. But we thought we'd started off with um, a bit of an inspiration of why we're doing these things and some of the creative possibilities that, um, <laughs> proper people like John and his studio are actually putting together. So uh, just a couple of little housekeeping things. Hello to our usual early birds. So hi, Jay, Stephen, Sharon and Simon. Great, thanks for checking on the tech. It's all working and you can see and hear us. This is great, greetings to you all. And as usual, there's just a couple of things. If you go to the events page on the Maxon website, then you can see all the wonderful things that we've been preparing for you, including this series of graphics. We've got presentation happening in uh, FMX this week, and also we've got some more uh, motion design show and more Ask the Trainers as well. So loads of stuff there. We record all of them, of course, and as you well know, if you just go over to a Maxon training team on YouTube, then you can see the recordings, including the recording of this session, which will be live in a couple of hours after we finish. And also, then we, because you've been kind enough to turn up, we want to offer you a free t-shirt in the sense that if you were coming along to a live event that we would be handing them out. So we'll give you the code um, and over the course of this webinar, so where, where you can go, in fact, spoiler alert, actually, if you go into the handout section of the webinar, you'll see there's a PDF and that's got all the links here, here it is. So it's got the links for the code and where to go for the t-shirt and importantly, some of the links that we'll be talking about because the, uh, there's a range of nice resources, including John's excellent Cineversity series of tutorials about this very subject. Great. Um, and so let's not waste any more time. Let's just jump straight into it. We've we've got a bunch of questions that we'd like to ask you, John, uh, because of your wide experience about perception, uh, working with um, the your amazing roster of clients at Perception. But um, also everyone who's listening, please jump in with your questions that you'd like to ask John. And the first question is, John, I, I kind of glossed over this slightly, but could you just tell us a, a brief overview of Perception and what you guys do? Sure. So uh, Perception has been around since 2001. Um, this is this is going to be our 20th year. Um, and when the company started, we were a relatively traditional motion graphics boutique working on lots of uh, ad agency uh, projects, a lot of broadcast work and whatnot. And around 2009 or so, we made our first uh, splash into working on film and we created a bunch of uh, tech gadgets and, and user interfaces that appeared in Iron Man 2. Um, and that really sent us on a very specific trajectory where we really started to focus on this idea of the future of technology, doing that in a lot of fictional films. And then also we're really proud of the fact that we have been for the last decade spending about 50% of our time working on feature films and 50% of our time working on real world uh, futuristic technology products and kind of bouncing back and forth between those those two spaces and you know it's a it's a fun story that we love to share this whole idea of you know seeing science fiction evolve into science fact it's it's the question that comes up most of all about what does fui stand for and the, the people have got their their favorite um kind of reasons for it like fantasy or fake but a futuristic seems to be the the, the word of choice but also it kind of suggests something that um, it, that has to be of the future. So uh, the the if I'm not mistaken, the term FUI was coined by Mark Colloran, who's a, a legend in this sort of space. And you know, in the year 
2003 or or somewhere around there, it seemed as though he was the only person in the entire world that focused entirely on this idea of designing futuristic interfaces seen seen in film. And I believe he coined it as maybe fantasy or fictional user interface. Um, I think futuristic probably fits the best is or is the most common, but uh, I'm open to any and all interpretations. Any any of your favorite F words uh, going in there, I think they all work wonderfully. Um, but uh, at the same time, I also like, there's part of me that almost uh, bumps up against the idea of, you know, futuristic user interfaces or the idea that the future is, uh, you know, making something in the style of the future or like suggesting that the future is just an aesthetic and not you know something so much more inherently complicated about like hey this is just the way the world is or has evolved or has improved or or whatnot um so i'm i'm always a little iffy on on the term uh fui even though i'm i'm very proud of the fact that it's like enough of a niche industry to have coined its own uh its own term Absolutely. It's, it's call it whatever you like. If it looks amazing, then it's worked. Yeah. We've got, in fact, talking of looking amazing, we've got some examples of some of the work that you've done recently. In fact, can I throw the screen over to you, Nick? Because Nick's got these queued you, up. You could, Simon. And I was going to ask John. I have the perception, the feature film montage from 2020. Do you think that's a good like starting place to give people a sense of of the type yeah, of work that you do? I, like think, I think so. Yeah, go go okay. right ahead and and put that up. And I mean, you know, it's a it's a great example of our work in fiction, which I think is our most visible work that we do. What it does not include is our work that we do in real world technologies. And and a big reason for that is so much of that work that we do is incredibly secretive or confidential, or maybe even be for things that won't even be to market or out there in the real world for, for maybe two or even five years. Um, but I think, you know, uh, most people that are familiar with perception of the work I, that we do um, know us for our, our work in film. Cool, I'm gonna let this play and just let, uh, let me know if you guys can hear and see this. Hopefully it's not too loud as well. Yeah, I don't hear anything, but I'm I'm more than happy to even just ramble over it. You okay. know, just imagine that there's snappy, you know, montage music playing over this. Uh, so, you know, uh, this includes uh, this reel includes a lot of our work uh, designing futuristic tech for various films, as well as uh, a number of films that we've created. Uh, you know, not just the tech for, but made title sequences and other design-driven elements. Sometimes it's a stylized montage that plays out in the middle of the film to uncover a conspiracy or, or things like that. Uh, in many cases, it's, you know, main on end uh, title sequences that play at the end of the films and sort of, you know, summarize or wrap up uh, the, the films themselves. Uh, but yeah, we, we love working in this space. It's been a, a huge amount of fun uh, dabbling in these, these kinds of projects. We're unbelievably proud that we get to contribute to things that are, are as widely seen as some of these big movies and also things that, you know, we know these movies uh, will, will kind of be around in the cinematic zeitgeist for, for some time. Um, so it's it's been a, a tremendous honor to have an opportunity to contribute to and and collaborate with the film studios on on some of these projects. Um, it's and and no question, it's some very very hard work, but it's also unbelievably satisfying to get the whole team together and go out to the theater and and sit down, you know, and and see one of these things unfold on screen and in front of a packed house. Uh, Chun in the um, questions panel has asked us to post a link to this, which I just have, so that you can check this out um, your, for yourselves as well, with audio. With audio, yes. And I have some, some more examples uh, queued up that I'll show in a bit. I, I, I was curious in this, in John, and just what I saw, I guess, of that humongous collection of feature films that you've like worked on, what was... What was like the most challenging from a, um, an FUI perspective? 
So uh, they're all they're all challenging in in different ways, but I think the the ones that we enjoy the most tend to be the most challenging. Or I, I would say we've had the worst experiences that we've had working in film is when we're working with a film studio who isn't providing a challenge at all, and they just kind of come to us and say, "Hey, we just need a bunch of like glowing blue shit so that people know that the story is taking place in the future. So if you could just slap some stuff, you know, on the wall in the background or whatnot, that would be great." Um, and we we almost never have you know successful collaborations when when that's the brief. Um, we've been really fortunate to have an ongoing relationship with Marvel Studios who really take the idea of technology and just you know science and engineering in general really seriously in these films i mean you think of how many of the characters are inventors and scientists and and doctors and and whatnot um they tend to have an appetite for the depth that we're you know really interested in going into in terms of not just making some cool uh complicated looking technology but creating some some paradigms or some you know interactions that have a lot of depth uh, a lot of logic and insight that are driving them and and invite the the audience's imaginations to just really explore you know what all the what are all the things that are happening off screen in these worlds uh you know for for us definitely the most challenging but also like most satisfying for us would be the work on on black panther where we got you know the ultimate brief of all briefs which was just there's this world of Wakanda. It has the most advanced technology that could exist in the entire uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe. And it's also technology that hasn't been informed by anything else that we've seen in the world. It has to be totally unique and, and distinct. And so we put a huge amount of effort into just the, the core concepts that were underlying and driving the tech in the world of of Wakanda, which I think paid off really well uh, in our in our work in Black Panther. With the great and, question from Jay on this very topic, actually, John, how much does the design change from your initial idea to the final rendered image? I, I'm guessing a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes uh, it it always changes. Um, I think the question is you know, to us is like, is the core idea still there? Is the core concept that's driving all of this still follow through um, in the in the final product? And I think that's the thing that's most important to uh, to us. And, and with Black Panther, it really did very, very early in the stage um, of, you know, the, the film had not even begun uh, shooting yet. They were still in pre-production and still fine tuning the script of the film. And we we came in and did some consultations with the filmmakers and came up very early on with this idea of vibranium sand uh, being a, a particulate matter that could levitate in space, being levitated by ultrasonic sound waves, all very much inspired by and informed by some real world technologies that we had been exposed to with some of our, our real world tech clients and came up with this idea that, all right, in, in Black Panther, what makes the idea of like holograms completely different from what we've seen in any other film is that they're physical. It's this, this black sand that hovers in the air and can take any shape or form that, that you could imagine and that it's interacted it with in this way that's like much more physical and, and tangible. And so that was literally, that was something that came out of, I think our very first meeting that we had. And we worked on this film for almost 18 months. And through that whole process, we kept uh, coming back to that idea. Uh, it's leveraged in the film in a ton of different ways um, from, you know, various different uh, interfaces to even inspiring the way that uh, T'Challa's suit builds on around him and whatnot, and even ended up extending from that into a opening prologue sequence that tells the detailed history of the world of Wakanda, uh, and, and is this sort of like, you know, a million years ago sort of, sort of sequence, and the whole thing is rendered and told through this vibranium sand medium. Um, and then we got to close out the film with the main on end title sequence, which is effectively like, you know, almost a celebratory music video 
uh, but is also all rendered in in vibranium sand. But we made it, you know, much more vivid, much more colorful. We had all the sand was being driven uh, by a a custom made song for the title sequence made by Kendrick Lamar, uh, which was uh, that just alone was like mind blowing for us that we got to do something that was made, you know, uh, uh, in in sequence with that. And uh, yeah, so, you know, this was, I think, a, a great example of where like, yeah, we went through a million different iterations of the design and the style and the way that it would move and undulate and all these things. But the core idea, I think, was there from the from the very start. And, you know, that's something that we always uh, strive for on on our end. But it, it, you know, it means that 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 core idea needs to be really well thought out. It needs to be extensible. It needs to be flexible. It needs to be able to adapt into a lot of different things for it to be able to sort of survive the rest of the filmmaking process. Oh, Simon, I, uh, I actually don't hear you right now. Yeah, I think you're muted. You might be muted. All right, it's not a proper webinar unless you're on mute. Um, <laughs> Would you find is that the typical duration? 18 months, Sharon was asking, not only how um how long does a project take and how long is the render, but I think it's that's more akin to how long is a piece of string. That's I suppose it always depends on each job to job. Yeah. Um so uh Black Panther was particularly extensive um in part because we were brought aboard very early in the process because they knew technology was going to be so central to this story they wanted to start thinking about it very early on and i think the studio brought us on thinking like okay we'll have a few conversations with these guys and then come back to them in a year when we're going into post-production and instead we just kind of kept iterating on ideas fleshing them out trying different applications of things for different scenes in the in the film and whatnot um so we're seeing more of that where we're where we're working with the filmmakers uh, very, very early in the process, just to you know, just to consult and provide uh, guidance and ideas around the way technology can like serve more of like a, a world building kind of function in these stories. Um, but there's also other cases where uh, we're contacted uh, just as the edit is getting locked in, and hey, can you guys come in? We're we're just starting to apply VFX, and we've got you know. Um, three months or six months to, you know, mm -hmm. apply effects to a number of different specific shots. Uh, and there's been ones where we've been contacted because, oh, we just changed the script and there's a new scene that's, you know, being plugged into the film and we need some technology concepts to appear on screen and help to like reinforce what's happening uh, narratively uh, or whatnot. And I mean, we've done stuff where we come in literally in the final weeks uh, before uh, before a film is released to theaters, uh, just to drop in some some key pivotal elements. Sometimes so cool. you hear the stories behind the the hours that there are between the fight, the render being complete and actually the the movie starting to be shown. No, a, co a common nightmare, you know, to be to be had on our team is that you like, you know, you have this dream that you're going to see the movie and your your phone buzzes and you look down at it and it's like, oh, there's a scene coming up in like 10 minutes that that we need a couple changes <laughs> for, you know, uh, but it's it's I mean, the way that the films are now digitally distributed and whatnot, like no question, we are we are more than able more than ever able to take it all the way to the wire. John, I was I was actually sorry. I was uh, actually curious when I was looking at the the Black Panther montage, and you were saying it's 18 months it takes. Like when we say that, like how many people were involved um, at perception to get that that work done? Like how many people were working on the project at a given time throughout the the multiple stages? So our our team is is typically relatively tight knit and small on a project like this. Um, on Black Panther, we were probably fluctuating between two and six artists um, for the for the duration of that of that process. Um, and you know, everybody plays a, a pretty big role in in the efforts when we've got a team that's that small on a project like this. Uh, but uh, we're we're super proud of you know the way our team is able to 
execute ideas, you know, uh, swiftly and efficiently, but also with a great deal of like insight and, and confidence to be able to just make decisions, move on stuff and make these, these ideas and these concepts come together really, really effectively. Very cool. There's Would Barry's you... come up with a, a great, a great letter for it. The F stands for fantastic. <laughs> And Would also you... a couple, a couple oh, of questions sorry. related to that. Um, Chun's asking, do you invent a, a whole design language for each project or can you build for a foundation library to choose from? And then related to that, Scan is wanting to know, are there specific rules for an interface? So I think those, those two questions are bracketed. Sure. So um, we we are like the almost the first key step in any of these projects is developing like what are going to be the unique characteristics that align whatever technology we're creating with the characters or the universe that this story takes place inside of. Um, so that's a that is a definite yes. We're always creating you know a a visual vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Um, that's that's almost always very distinct to uh, to that film. Um, and I'm sorry, Simon. What was the the second part of that question? It's the uh, do you have a specific language? I suppose, or, or would that be related to characters? Because many many of these interfaces have a a way of communicating that isn't a specific language. So you're kind of making oh, up characters sure. as well. So, I mean, the the most important thing is just that the the user interface or the technology is communicating in any way that it can. And sometimes we have to do that in many different ways. I mean, we've all seen screens where, you know, someone sits down in front of it and in like a 150 point typeface from one side of the monitor to the other, it says access denied, right? And like, that's not the way computers work. Come on, guys. Like that's we, we know that doesn't really happen. Um, but you you have to you know you're there's an expectation that you need to hit the audience over the head with certain pieces of information because at the end of the day these these fictional interfaces the real purpose that they're serving is is storytelling and like you know we think of we we kind of think of it as like two ways like when you're doing real world interface design you're you should be focused on human centered design you're creating you know all of the answers to every question that you have is does this improve the experience for the end user in film there's sort of like two end users there's the character that's interacting with it in the film and then there's the person sitting in the back row of the movie theater you know eating popcorn watching the film and and consuming this this story and so we need to make sure that at all times it's working on a level for the character within the film so that it, it feels plausible, but it also needs to, you know, communicate whatever the intent is to the audience. So sometimes you're doing that with text that's on screen. Maybe there's sound design cues and whatnot. Often there's uh, imagery or iconography that you're creating to convey complex um, uh, concepts across all sorts of visual systems you know maps are almost always persistent in some way shape or form in these things which themselves are this own visual system right um but the key thing is it's like do whatever it takes to get the plot points across to the audience um and and for us it's like you just use whatever tool you have to do that and sometimes you only have a few seconds to do that because of oh, the... fractions of a second sometimes yeah and even the way things move or animate or flash or whatnot you know you could have something that's written in an alien language that nobody can understand but if you design it properly the audience should still be able to you know interpret that that means you know self-destruct in five seconds or or something like that right um it's a it's a critical and important thing or even think of uh uh you know one of my one of my favorites in the movie predator uh what 1987 or or something the you know the monster at the end of the movie starts a self-destruct thing on his you know wrist panel and it's you know alien gobbledygook lights that are flashing but you hear the sound it sounds like it's getting more intense and like even arnold schwarzenegger in the film is like oh no this is gonna be bad and has to like get up and run away you know um, so it's 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 sort of whatever whatever tricks you have you know leverage all of them to get these points across we, we were talking about this earlier and chad had a great observation about the complexity of design 
and how some things look possibly more complex occasionally than they need to be. But I mean, you, you've got thoughts about this, Chad, don't you? Yeah, I mean, it seems like, I mean, in the same way that there seems like there's like a, I would imagine, I don't, I don't work at this level, but I mean, it, you know, there's a balance between, like you said, the story and the design. It seems like there would also be a balance between, you know, the, the functionality of the design and the sexiness of the design. Because, you know, if you're making a really simple user interface that's like, you know, you just want to show access denied and someone's just trying to log in, but like that's all you have is what you would actually have on that screen where it's just like, log in. I mean, it feels like that would be too boring to have on screen. You got to add a bunch of crap to make that look sexier than it normally would be. And so it seems like that would be, in the same way you're constantly wrestling with story versus design, it seems like you'd also be wrestling a lot with, you know, sexiness versus functional design yeah and i mean it's you know i mean that a big part of that just sort of is design right like it's form and function and figuring out how those things balance together um and i think there's you know there's a lot of work that is out there in in this you know fui zeitgeist that is like mega complicated incredibly detail overwhelmingly complex stuff that is it's just gorgeous and i and i love that stuff i think aesthetically um it's really beautiful um and and to me it's a it's a really uh attractive aesthetic um but i would say at perception we we do pride ourselves on trying to strike the balance between stuff that doesn't just look like you know a thousand circuitry lines going everywhere and whatnot, but that there's an underlying logic. There's a sense that you can understand how a character might interact with this, or even if you see them use it in a in a brief moment, you can start to make assumptions about like, oh, but for that to take place, that means that this system must be hooked into this, which is tied to this other service, which means that there's this other stuff happening outside what I'm seeing on camera, you know, in this film. Um, but starts to sort of strengthen the idea of these realities being a little more plausible or something that audiences can buy into a little more. There's an interesting question from Kent, which actually leads to a question I know Nick was talking about earlier on before we jumped on that he'd like to ask you. Kent's asking, is are there any good Easter eggs to look for? in some of your designs? And I think that's kind of, we could reference the idea that you have to, um, certainly in the Marvel Universe, you've been mm -hmm. uh, cr creating designs for multiple years and, and the, the designs change over time and have different uses for different circumstances and different timings. I think you can put this more eloquently than me, Nick. Oh yeah, so in my question, it was actually related to towards the tech when we're looking at the overall Marvel Universe. Because what I find super interesting is that you've worked on Marvel uh, films from the beginning, like phase one or phase two, and now the blips happened. So we're like five years in the future. And if I'm correct, you guys did some work on WandaVision as well. So I was curious how that that tech has changed or um, throughout the, the Marvel Universe in terms of its design and structure. So uh, we're incredibly cognizant of the idea of there being sort of like a pecking order to Marvel tech where, you know, Tony Stark is, you know, way up here and S.H.I.E.L.D. is not like FBI level down here. It's somewhere in between, maybe even has a little Tony Stark influence to it at a certain point. Uh, Spider-Man's tech is technically sort of Tony Stark's tech, so it kind of floats up here, but is a little more playful. Uh, the tech of Wakanda is like somewhere way at the, you know, tippy top of the of the spectrum. And so we, we have a, we, you know, on our own have a, a good instinct for where these things should fit or align. Um, and of course, the filmmakers, the directors, the executive producers, great, you know, collaborators at Marvel Studios, always give us some some guidance on that as well in terms of how you know where everything should sort of land in this uh in this pecking order um the the other question about easter eggs um there's i think anybody that works on this sort of stuff has probably a you know a laundry list or, or even a, a secret black book somewhere of like every easter egg that they've 
dropped into these things. I mean, in, in tons of these films, you can find, uh, you know, uh, uh, team members, you know, names and birth dates and, you know, our enemies' social security numbers and, and whatever else that we can weave in there. Um, we've had some really fun ones in uh, Captain America, The Winter Soldier. There's a sort of conspiracy montage that unfolds in the middle of the film. And as a lot of that is uh, circling around uh, former Hydra evil scientist Arnim Zola, who worked, uh, was recruited by S.H.I.E.L.D. along with a bunch of other Hydra scientists to come together and work on, on S.H.I.E.L.D. tech. And in that montage, there's a, a brief moment where we're showing all of these vintage images of, of Arnim Zola uh, before he was trapped in the in the computer, uh, as you see here, and as he's giving this voiceover and describing this, there's this image that flashes up. It's Zola, he's surrounded by all these other evil scientists, and uh, it was a real photograph uh, that we had found and that we had, you know, we were going through the rights management for it. Uh, and because the photograph was a real vintage photograph, we would have had to get clearance from every single person, uh, many of which were now deceased and would have had to get clearance from those people's estates and, and whatnot to use their images. So uh, the solution was that we would just put every single one of our uh, team members into the photo instead. And so there's this one image where it's literally every single person that had worked on the project and we were working on Winter Soldier for probably close to a year or so. And so there's like a dozen different folks that had all worked on it at different points in the process who are all now, uh, you know, evil Nazi scientists uh, in there. So uh, it's not the, you know, it's it's not the proudest claim to fame, but we're, but we, we made our way into the, into the film in that way. Hey, Nate, would you mind bringing up that image of Zola again? Because um, I just also was going to ask you, John, just to talk about the the design process behind this, because it's an interesting one, because you're you're needing to create something futuristic, but also something that is retro and that communicates to the audience, too. So how, how, how did you approach that? So this one was so much fun to play with. Um, we got the brief from them explaining, all right, so there's a there's this evil Hydra scientist from the first film, and we're going to revisit him, but he's going to be kind of like trapped in a computer. And the studio was pretty, uh, the studio and, and the directors, the Russo brothers, were relatively transparent about like this whole thing just might not work like we're we're kind of terrified that this gag could turn into um max hedrome if you're if you're familiar <laughs> with that um with this really like because it's it's a very high concept idea that this you know this evil scientist is now like sort of trapped in a computer um and and there's, you know, there's great underlying logic. He's he's explaining he's transferred his consciousness into a computer, um, and the computer that he transferred his consciousness into was a machine that was made in the, you know, 50s or 60s, um, and so it's literally a a computer that is like the size of a room, reel to reel tape machines and and whatnot. And so we went back to some of the earliest uh, graphics uh, generating computer systems, which were around in that time period and just starting to, uh, to, to come up. There's the, I think it's called the Tektronix 8060 or something like that, where you can see it like burning in this neon green image, almost like a plotter that would move along and create these like sort of vector shapes, but drawing them out on the screen one line at a time, they would sort of burn into this monochromatic display and hang there for a moment. We use that as, as some tremendous inspiration here uh, when working on Zola. And, you know, we, we pitched a whole bunch of different concepts and ideas that were all varying levels of primitive but this one worked the best i think because 
it was just skirting on the edge of legibility and being able to see a character in it. And even when it's not moving, it's almost hard to see. But once it is moving and you hear the character's voice coming through it and his mouth kind of moves like lips, but also looks like a waveform at the same time, it just really conveyed this idea that this vintage tech was being like overdriven and like, you know, overclocked or like pushed to the absolute max just to be able to create this this image um and so it's it's to me it's one of uh my favorite things that i think we've ever done because it had such a unique and distinct aesthetic that i thought fit the the scene of the film really well i have a follow-up question can i ask a follow-up question please like i i'm enchanted by all of the the research that you've done like like learning about like this computer from the 50s and i'm i'm guessing for the vibranium sand that you did research on audio, whatever you say, ultrasonic, something, something that's, I don't understand. Um, so like, it seem, I'm guessing that like, you don't kind of come into work that day being like, oh yeah, we'll just have ultrasonic sound. I know this can work because blah, blah, blah. Or I know this like 50s computer. So I'm guessing that like, when these challenges come up, you have to do a bunch of extra research and learn about all these crazy cool things. And I'm just curious if there's something that's like super fun tech that you've learned about or um, that's really got your attention the most uh, because of research you had to do for something. Sure. Um, so, you know, it's it's actually 50-50. I'd say it's 50% research. And I don't want to make it seem easy, but we all geek out on this stuff all the time. And so not just when it's applicable to a project that we're using, but we're always sharing with each other cool references and interesting you know technology paradigms whether it's stuff that's bleeding edge or oh someone hacked some old nixie tubes to do this or or that or or whatnot um and so we have already i think inherently everyone on our on our team and again you know our team are uh we we take this stuff up like unbelievably seriously for given like what a specific focus it is we are we are really deep into this world we love geeking out over this stuff and so sometimes when these projects come in it's just immediately like oh yeah like when when black panther came in like one of the very first things that came up was like oh uh cymatic patterns when you run sound frequencies through certain grains or particulate, they move into geometric patterns and shapes. Like that seems relevant here. And then, you know, from there, oh, sound, you know, that reminds me of the ultrasonic sound wave thing we were using for midair haptics a couple years back. Let's look into that. And that led to, oh, the university at Tokyo is using that same rig or setup to levitate styrofoam particles in midair. And that ended up like becoming the concept of, of vibranium sand. So there is, there is a lot of it that you know, I don't want to call it just like anecdotal or like this casual knowledge that we've amassed over time, but there is there is a lot of that there. But of course, you know, research plays a really big role in it. Um, again, I think our our team are so tuned into you know where to hunt for this kind of stuff and where to to go looking for these things, and and also just having this sort of instinct for like, well, what are things that are completely plausible and realistic today? that have the headroom to be extrapolated into something maybe a little more uh, exciting or, or cinematic. Hmm. We've got a couple of um, other follow-up questions uh, about this. But I had a couple of questions about your workflow and generally do you start off with a particular workflow in mind, whether it's say Cinema 4D or After Effects or depending on whether it's 2D or 3D. Um, and also but some other renderers are available, everyone. But they also, the Sharon's asking, in that particular case, were what was the render engine and the particle system that you used for the uh, those titles in Black Panther? So uh, Black Panther, which we were, the movie came out in 2018, early 2018. We were working on it through the bulk of 2017. And that was our first time formally committing to Redshift as a render engine. Um, which was a it was a big thing for us. We were up until that point, shortly before Black Panther, we were a studio that was made almost entirely of uh, Mac Pros, um, and we we made the decision to bid farewell to those and and start piling in you know PCs with graphics cards and and whatnot. It was a giant pain in the ass because while we were working on Black Panther, 
the uh, cryptocurrency market had a huge boom and it made it really hard to get your hands on the what i guess there was like the 1080 ti's at the time that were the go-to graphics card and it made it really hard for us to acquire enough cards to even render all the stuff that uh that we needed to uh to render out but we we found our ways and whatnot um but uh yeah so uh rendering you know we're as a, as a studio we're always open to everything but we're definitely committed to uh redshift um, otherwise the pipeline for me is like, yes, there's an extent to which it's like, you know, we're going to make some stuff in 3d and then, you know, comp it in after effects, maybe even do final comp or color work in nuke or, or something like that. But the most critical thing to me is, uh, because we spend so much time ideating and iterating, it's just like, don't care whatever the fastest way it is to get the idea in a place where we can share it with the filmmakers and you know sometimes that means we're making sketches sometimes that means we're gluing sand to toy truck models and holding them in our hands and making crappy iphone videos with them and and whatnot um sometimes it means we're mocking stuff up in after effects sometimes it means we're doing wireframes in in cinema or even mid fidelity renders in in redshift and whatnot but you know for me the core thing is and and I'm, i i go on and on about this but just working at the minimum level of fidelity that does the idea justice so that you can validate if the idea is worth pursuing further it's that creative aspect that creative thinking which is outside the tool in some respects yeah, absolutely. It's it's whatever whatever it takes. But side questions to that would be if you were what would you look for if some so if somebody wanted to work for perception and they wanted to progress their FUI skills and so on, is there any particular advice that you give people? Sure. So uh first off, like I'm I'm always looking for people. So if anybody is interested don't be shy about uh pinging us uh you know we're we're easy to find and track down and hit us on social media or whatever um we're always looking for talented artists um the things that are most important to me are a a typically a sort of generalist skill set um i think we're we're almost always looking for people who are 3d artists but also are very comfortable doing design work or particularly the sort of like almost traditional graphic design work that goes into uh, interactive concepts, whether that is FUI or real world products, um, but also having some of those, you know, technical 3D abilities. And, and from there, it's just kind of, you know, it's the standard uh, tool set, um, you know, uh, the Adobe suite, uh, Cinema 4D, Redshift is is great. Uh, always open to people who are getting into Houdini, getting into the game engines, getting into any of the other stuff that's on the on the periphery. Um, and and I think also nowadays more than ever, it used to be that just like there was kind of like oh there's one tool that everybody uses for this stuff, but I fi I'm finding the the landscape for the tools that we use is becoming so much more broad. And as a result, you know, our expectation is that artists themselves will have some degree of fluid fluidity or be open to learning uh, new platforms or or getting into things that they haven't used previously. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's great advice. The, the we come across this um, all the time: the specialist versus generalist art argument, if you like. Mm -hmm. So that that's a great uh, that's a great viewpoint on it. The um, also a sort of related question from Chris is that um, all the amazing designs he says that you've been building for real world projects as well as for fictional projects. Um, do you see any of those interfaces making their way into real life? Do you think we'll start to adopt the the aspect? Do you think the the interfaces that we end up using will then reference it, some of the futuristic ones or the fictional ones that you've designed? So uh, that is that is effectively the way you know our business operates. Um, we spend some time working in in fiction and and generating things that have Maybe, you know, we think of working in film as being almost like a, a blue sky R&D laboratory where we can 
pitch you know more outlandish or more ambitious ideas uh, and then we work in with the real world clients who are always have an appetite for those ideas but have both uh, you know some technical limitations that have to be worked within um, but also you're making a real world product that has to be every decision has to be tailored towards the user that's going to be using it and operating it and and quite frankly things being like cinematic and flashy and cool wears thin really quick if the rest of the experience is shit so um you, you have to make sure that you're making something that is uh you know clever and innovative but not just aesthetically in every different part of of the experience and then for us that idea of you know that influence going from fiction into reality it doesn't just stop there it circles right back into fiction again and we again uh we have some of our most successful collaborations with filmmakers is because they love the fact that we're bringing this real world insight into their fictional concepts and it makes it a lot easier for them to understand again that there's you know logic that's driving these things beneath the surface which makes them more plausible and again even the even the audiences might not immediately pick up on like oh in black panther i noticed that there was a brief moment of like a cymatic pattern that undulated with a rhythmic bounce that must mean everything's controlled by ultrasonic sound waves let me research this and figure out if this is possible or not like we don't expect that audiences are going to pick that up but i do think that there's even you know without being able to discern it without being able to articulate it audiences still feel that thought that's gone into it and that underlying detail um that that makes it feel that much less shallow or or hollow of an effect so for us it's just it's just letting that that cycle continues you know the fiction inspires reality the reality inspires the fiction uh and every time we kind of take an orbit uh around those two planets we're getting faster stronger and 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 just you know better at at what we do it's so true you're almost training us in how to use future devices <laughs> that's uh that's that's the idea yeah do you have any like uh quick examples of some of the stuff that you've designed uh in the real world that's like public and that you're that you're happy with sure um so so much of it is top secret and is private some of it has been released and we're you know we're secretly behind the curtain you know being involved with those processes uh some of it are elements that won't be released uh even for a year or, or several more years down the down the road um but one of the things that's come out uh publicly very recently um was we spent about a year and a half collaborating with general motors on designing the entire uh, digital experience within the new uh, electric Hummer that will come out next year. So any time, any interaction that you're doing on any of the displays within the vehicle, uh, we we worked really closely with General Motors and and the GMC and the Hummer brand on creating these experiences, and it's and it's everything from the entire instrument cluster to effectively a full operating system that unfolds on the uh, center stack display in the vehicle and several other components. So everything from just letting, you know, seeing the speedometer and knowing what gear the, the vehicle is in to accessing and controlling a whole range of really wild features and functions. Uh, what you see on screen right here is just uh, when you change modes on the vehicle, uh, the vehicle is effectively able to change into different levels of capability based on how you're using it and when you change modes you get this beautiful animation that takes over the display to show you that you're moving from you know one mode or one environment to the next uh, based on the way that you'll be uh, utilizing the vehicle there's all sorts of i mean this this truck is so insane um it's a you know it's a very futuristic vehicle um, it's certainly got this incredible utilitarian aesthetic to it, but it's so unbelievably capable and can do all this insane stuff off-road. It's literally the first vehicle where all four wheels can turn in the same direction so that it can like strafe diagonally. And we had to create all sorts of uh, complex 
components of the experience to make sure that the user can take advantage of these future these features but also understand how they're using them and like what they're going to be doing with them because uh this it's a it's a big heavy monster of a vehicle and you kind of you know you need to be careful when you're operating something like this right and and there's a whole other world of complex implications when you're designing for a vehicle like this where you just have to make sure that um none of the experience is distracting to the user it's only just supporting everything that they want to take advantage of because uh a a user error in the case of a moving vehicle at highway speeds can have some really dire consequences so uh, again we have to really take the sort of notions of of user-centered design very very seriously when working on something like this absolutely and it has to be fast and communicated communicated quickly especially in if you're in the vehicle too yeah and that's that's something that um you know when we started doing this work in real world tech it was not unusual that i'd go into a boardroom at some uh very prestigious well-established company somewhere and there would be a room full of people where we're sharing our work and saying we think we can collaborate with you on this project and a bunch of the people in the room are very excited and and eager and there's always no matter what like you know one person in the room that raises their hand is like hey making all that shit for movies is nice and all but this is a real world product. Like, how are you going to uh, make our users' lives easier? And one of the parallels that we always draw is that in film, we're often, as we were talking about before, trying to convey complex information or concepts really quickly and really efficiently, especially in something like a vehicle. We need to do the same thing because we don't want the user's eyes to be staring at the instrument cluster and just being like, oh, there's a really beautiful complex pattern and shape language here, but I really just need to figure out, am I in reverse or drive? Like what's going on? Like we need people to just be able to have something where they can just glance down really quickly and in a fraction of a second, capture whatever data, whatever information they need to, um, to, to be able to, to go on with their, with their mission at hand. A quick question, side question from Chun. He's found you on Instagram. Is that the place to contact you, or would you prefer to be contacted through Perception's site? I'm probably uh, I'm probably most active on Twitter, um, and I'm just uh, Johnny Motion on on Twitter. That's probably the easiest place to you know follow me. Um, but uh, you can also we have uh, uh, a few places via the Perception website that you can contact us uh, in general. Uh, if anyone's looking to share, you know, a, a reel or, or a resume or anything along those lines. And then, you know, otherwise hit me on anywhere on social media with uh, with any questions or anything like that. Fantastic. We'll share all those links in the description when we post the recording in on YouTube as well. We can't let you go, John, without asking you about WandaVision. Yeah. And that wonderful title sequence at the end. Is it still called a title sequence if it's after the events? So the the technical term for it, which I think makes almost no sense at all to, to anyone that's not, you know, deep into this stuff is they call them uh, MOEs or main on end titles. But it's it's uh, it is, yes, just the title sequence. Um, so we worked on a whole bunch of different aspects of WandaVision, the biggest of which was definitely the the closing title sequence that plays at the end of every episode. Mm -hmm. um, but we also did a lot of work on some of the opening title sequences, um, some of the ones that were like era accurate, you know, flawless replicas of uh, various vintages of sitcom, even did things like update the Marvel Studios logo animation uh, to fit the aesthetic of the show. Um, we got to make a flawless replica mm -hmm. of the family ties title sequence which was uh which was a lot of fun um and and all of these different elements and then yeah the the big piece for us was the main on end title sequence where we we dive into this sort of you know pixel based world uh that feels like we're orbiting around inside the the chemistry of a of a vintage television set uh to see this world you know be constructed and then ultimately be uh disrupted uh, over the course of uh, of the series. 
but it changes slightly for each episode, doesn't it? And there's, yeah, there's... and that's something we've been doing on on a few of the uh, television series as we've been, you know, as as streaming shows have have grown in popularity and we've been finding ourselves making more and more title sequences for episodic content. We're always trying to find a way to to create, you know, something that keeps it fresh or, or interesting over the course of of multiple episodes. Trying to defeat that, you know, skip titles button. <laughs> It's an interesting thing, just on this, on these frames that um, Nick's showing at the moment, that kind of relationship between retro and futuristic in terms of diving into the screen and seeing how that manifests as more than just 2D pixels, if you like, but actually going into the world inside. What, what was your thinking behind the design for that? So when we, when we started working on this, um, Marvel had asked that the main on end title sequence not be something that's just locked in this retro aesthetic. They were they wanted to make sure that whatever we did, it still had the sort of like cinematic production value um, and and sophistication that we expect from their films. Um, so we came up with this idea that you know you would be uh navigating through the world of the pixels and that we would have aspects of it that would have a little bit of that like retro feeling and even as the sequence begins you feel like you're looking at it on the surface of a screen and you know being someone that was very much alive when when cathode ray tube televisions were the norm you know i i remembered being a kid and wanting to like inch up as close to the TV as I could get or like press my nose against the screen and feel like my nose hairs tickling and like, you know, everything buzzing off this surface and my mom would stick her head in the room and be like, don't get too close to the TV, it's gonna kill you, you know, and, and all this <laughs> stuff. And just that that idea that like, you know, when TVs as flat panel pixel displays, like we kind of get what's going on in them, but when they were this glass tube that had depth and like, it crackled, it popped, you, you know, if you would touch it, you could feel like it, you know, the, the spark coming off of it. It felt like there was this magic or this sort of like chemistry and witchcraft that was all inside of the, the tube. And we wanted to, to try and capture some of that magic. And we thought this would be, you know, a great opportunity to kind of dive in and then, you know, create this almost like world within the world that's that's being constructed um so uh the the team at, at marvel loved loved the concept and also really pushed us to take what was really you know started as just like we're gonna weave through some pixels and then disrupt it and really tie it even more directly into the idea that this world is being built and being constructed within the like medium of of television um, so it was a was a really fun ride for us, and uh, and I think you know uh, for us we didn't even I think realize how big of an impact it would have, especially because the first the first couple episodes of this show, which also because of the global pandemic, were the first bits of like new Marvel content that anyone had seen in in a year and a half at least, and the first couple of episodes are very unusual in terms of the marvel universe they are totally period accurate sitcoms uh the first episode was filmed in front of a live studio audience and so we were really excited that as the episode comes to a close and people were sort of like what is going on like this is what this is what this show is going to be that this title sequence came in and almost like grounded everything back to the idea of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, because even though the rest of the show was very different, this felt as though like it was making a statement of like, hold on tight, because this is still going to be a epic, you know, really sophisticated cinematic adventure that you're going to go on. It's very true, There's like, especially now we're watching these shows on a weekly basis, and we've got mm -hmm. a week to digest them and think about them and talk about them. Yeah. So yes. I've got an interesting question from Patience. She was um, asking, how do you prevent repetition and keep each project unique? So uh, that's that's pretty critical. And I think there's 
there's always an extent to which our past experiences inform our future experiences. You know, you start to develop a muscle memory for like, oh, well, you know what, there's this one kind of, you know, camera move that always works, or there's this one uh, trick or technique that's always very satisfying. Um, but you have to be careful not to rely on those sort of things. Like you can use those things to help you when you're backed into a corner and you need a clever escape to, to get out. But otherwise, I, I would like to think that our, you know, our ideas and our solutions are first and foremost always built off of whatever project it is that we're working on. And we've got a few, you know, particularly when we're working on something like a title sequence, we've got a couple like internal challenges that we give ourselves um, right from the onset, many of which are based off of, you know, past bits of feedback uh, that we've gotten from our clients. And I think, you know, some of the, the key things are like, if we're making a title sequence and we know it's gonna be two minutes long, uh, which many of the title sequences that we've worked on are about, you know, uh, two minutes, two and a half minutes long, it's a really long time. And you have to figure out how do you keep the audience's attention over two minutes? And it can't just be like, oh, the whole thing's made out of watercolors. So just see, you know, another image paint on as, you know, bleeding watercolor paints. And then another image does the same thing. And then the next image does the same gag. You have to make sure that you're finding a way to keep this uh, this motif or whatever the style or aesthetic you've chosen uh, building and progressing through, through the whole sequence. Um, the other thing that we try to challenge ourselves with is whatever ideas or concepts we're pitching, how can we ensure that it would only work on this particular client's project and not just be something that's like, oh, cool, that's clever motif number 17. Sure, that could apply on this or it could apply on any other project or commercial or or whatever it is. How do we make sure that whatever it is feels like it it really would only work on, on that particular project? I see this with stock clips all the time. When you've got a library. And when when I've been working on certain tour sports tournaments, you think, oh, that is that is number seventeen. So yeah, this is true. The, uh, we're we're shortly going to be running out of time, so I just wanted to ask Chad and Nick. Um, I've been dominating the questions, so please jump in. Have you got any last questions you'd like to ask, John? I don't. I've just been soaking up this this whole thing. I feel like I could listen to you talk for another like several hours and just be like, <laughs> yes, go. Like it's amazing. <laughs> Uh, yes, totally. It was. It's been so informative just to to hear about your experiences and the stuff that you're creating. I I did have one question though. And I think I was kind of for the audience too, which was I was wondering, going back to uh, FUIs and feature film, if you could maybe tell us some tricks for really selling the final shot in terms of compositing. If there were any tricks that you guys used or could share, and it could be platform agnostic or cinema 4d related yeah sure so uh if you talk to anyone who works uh who has done a lot of work in this sort of like fui space it's not uncommon mm -hmm. that there you create the content or the designs and then a completely different studio is tasked with compositing them or integrating them into the final film, which can be fucking terrifying because you've you've spent all this time and effort making these elements, and then someone else is going to determine just how much they, you know, how luminescent they are, how much atmosphere surrounds them, how do they, you know, glow and and really jump off of the screen. Um, so when it comes to compositing i mean certainly you want to make sure that these things are thoughtfully composited and integrated um in all the obvious ways that they're you know emitting light off of them and onto surfaces if it's a luminescent hologram or a you know say a transparent display or, or something along those lines it's looking for ways to make sure that you're catching all the little details like are you seeing reflections in people's eyes of these things and and whatnot but mostly to me, it comes down to like, that's where you are going to set the final bit of the aesthetic. Like how vibrant are these elements? How much are they glowing? Are there certain aspects or elements of the UI 
that are the key heroic elements. Let's say you have something that has a lot of different complex elements, but there's one particular window or image or element that's doing the storytelling heavy lifting. Can you make sure that that area has the most contrast, vibrancy, maybe other elements are even falling out of focus or, or whatnot, but as long as those key points are sharp and are, are vibrant or have the extra glow applied to them, I think there's a lot that can be done just in the composite alone to take, you know, a, a B minus UI and take it all the way to like an A plus just with, with some of those, those little tricks and, and whatnot. And I think, you know, again, take a look at the, the reels of any of the artists that are in this space. Many of them uh, don't have the chance to composite some of these shots themselves but we'll do these beautiful deconstructions in their own reels where they take the elements and split them apart in Z space and there's shallow depth of field and the rack focus is drawing your attention to the elements that uh, are the most important or make the most sense. And I think there's a lot that you can, you can pull from that. Absolutely, because as you said before, it's a team effort and that's that, the whole message that it's a combination of all the elements to communicate that. Yeah, speed. and I mean, you know, it goes it goes without saying, you know, uh, it's a team effort, 150 percent. And that goes, you know, all the way from for us, you know, having awesome collaborators like Marvel Studios, who, again, give us a lot of leeway to put these things together and, and actually, you know, invest in our appetite to push these things as far as we can. Um, but it's also a team effort in terms of, you know, our relatively small team on these projects, the guys on our team work so unbelievably hard. We've got an incredible staff uh, that that knock it out of the park every time and continue to kind of raise the bar for ourselves. And we've also got a, a great pool of freelancers that we collaborate with who, you know, come, come back to the studio again and again to help us out with some of these projects. And it's, you know, none of these things are done without a ton of really talented people uh, bringing amazing ideas to the table and having this incredible sense of, you know, commitment to seeing these things all the way through. Uh, and, and not every aspect of these projects is as fun as it sounds. There's some really difficult parts of the process. And uh, we're, we're very fortunate that our team, you know, both of, of full-timers and, and the folks that come in and, and help us out have such incredible dedication to be able to see these projects all the way through to the finish line especially when we're when we're working hard on something it's late at night and like a ad appears you know or comes out online saying like tickets are now available for the movie because it comes out in only like in only a couple <laughs> weeks and we're still working on it oh shit you know what are we gonna do to finish this up and, and whatnot um but i i can't be you know i'm, I'm unbelievably thankful that uh you know the i'm i'm you know just one piece of the complex puzzle at perception in, in making these things come true that's amazing amazing work you're all doing um, can we close up with one last question that was asked earlier on what's if you can talk about this what's next for perception so uh we have all sorts of really exciting things happening both in in the fictional space and in the reality space um naturally most of those things are extremely confidential uh but uh you know in reality we're working on a really exciting um digital platform that i think is already somewhat ubiquitous and very familiar to many people that we're working on a way that will level it up as you know some certain emerging technologies are coming online and, and really broadening the horizons of like everything that's going to be possible in tech um, we're working on some really exciting automotive projects that will be for some of the most exciting vehicles that will come out in the in the coming years um, and then in the world of fiction uh, we're working on uh you know in every different part of the process on uh films and other streaming series and whatnot whether it is doing you know technology as a as a world building tool uh working on elements that will be 
composited into some of these films and shows as as tech and graphics um and and working on more uh title sequence projects as well uh some of which are things that have like kind of been finished or been in the can for for months now and due to uh the you know the the global situation you know have been sort of just waiting in the wings to be uh to be released so uh, a lot of exciting stuff uh that will be coming from us in the coming months and and even years uh so i would strongly recommend you know please follow us on on our social platforms and and whatnot don't be a stranger we're gonna have all sorts of cool stuff that we can't wait to share with the world whenever uh what the earliest moment that we're allowed to we try our hardest to do some really in-depth case studies that dive deep into any of these projects. A lot of the stuff that we've talked about today, I'm just starting to scratch the surface on, and there's a ton of material on our website uh, that you can comb through if you're if you're curious to hear uh, any more about any of this stuff. And uh, yeah, you know, uh, and as as always, I'm always eager to hear from everyone else out here in the in the industry and in this space. I want to see uh, you know as many of uh you know the artists in this space the things that they're working on and and what they're up to so please nobody be a stranger uh don't hesitate to to reach out if you have any any questions or anything along the way that was that was a great segue for showing your twitter handle and just to encourage people to reach out to you as well fantastic and apologies if we didn't get around to everyone's questions um, and lots of great comments, um, by the way, coming in, John, about what a fantastic presentation and we could listen to you talk for hours. So this this is absolutely fantastic and a marvelous base for our next few weeks where we're going to delve into some of these ideas and we're going to be talking about. In fact, here's the the, the link. If you go to the events page on the Maxon site here, here they are listed where we're talking more about FUI and how you can do some of these things sometimes sort of as good as a B minus, but hopefully better than that. Um, <laughs> or, and how you can do them quickly using some of the tools that we do. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to, to talk with you. And I also, you know, a huge thanks for supporting the community in the way that you guys do. The, the work that we do is made uh, so much easier by having access to these amazing tools that really I think are, you know, a, a big inspiration to all of us artists as we're working with this stuff, whether, you know, it's from the perspective of these tools uh, being easy to use, so we don't even have to think about using them, we can just focus on the ideas, but also so many times the capabilities of these tools and the things that we're learning about them end up inspiring some of the concepts that that we come up with so uh a huge thanks uh keep keep doing what you guys are doing and uh i look forward to being in contact with you in the future brilliant thanks so thank much. you so much thanks so much john fantastic thank you everyone for joining us thanks for letting us overrun <laughs> you know it was going to happen so, <laughs> <laughs> of course and we'll post a recording to this um, in the next couple of hours and hopefully see you next Monday when we dive into some of these techniques. But thank you, everyone. And see Take you care. next one. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.